episode number one with media mogul Strauss Zelnick. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Strauss Zelnick. Strauss is the chairman and CEO of Take-Two Interactive, a video game publisher which makes Grand Theft Auto amongst many other hit titles. Take-Two is a public company currently valued at more than $4 billion. He is also founder and head of ZMC, a private equity fund with several hundred million under management focused on the media and communications sector. Previously, Strauss was the CEO of BMG Entertainment, one of the world's largest music publishers at the time, CEO of Crystal Dynamics, a venture-backed video game producer, and president of 20th Century Fox, of course, one of the biggest movie studios. Strauss, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're the CEO of a public company, and you're the head of a private equity fund. Both of them are pretty demanding full-time jobs and then some. So I'm going to start there. How do you juggle both of those? Well, the structure of our enterprise at ZMC is that we're we're a private equity firm. We take control positions in digitally focused media and communications companies. And Take Two is part of the ZMC portfolio. It's um, while it's a public company, it's externally managed by ZMC and specifically. The, I'm, I'm the chairman and CEO, and Carl Sladoff, who's a partner at ZMC, is the president. So while it's a relatively unusual structure, believe it or not, there are about 20 public companies in the U.S. that are managed in this way, excluding REITs, which are often managed in this way. Um, so I, it, so I, while it may appear that I'm wearing two hats, I'm really wearing one hat. Uh, there's no doubt that because Take-Two is our biggest enterprise and a public company, that it I devote a lot of time to my role here, but it fits very well, almost neatly with uh, what CMC does. If we go back in time, where did all this ambition come from originally? Were you self-driven as a kid? Did your parents have really high expectations on you? No, my parents actually had um, almost no expectations. Their their attitude was um, do what you want to do and be excellent at it and they they actually meant that so some some people that's uh that's code for you know become a doctor and a really good doctor and then we'll talk my, my family really they really meant it at one point for example i i was thinking seriously of becoming a writer and my dad encouraged me to take a year off um, between college and whatever the real world would bring in order to pursue writing which i didn't do um so i think you know like Many people who are ambitious are are sort of born that way. And I I was always interested in entertainment. I was always interested in creative businesses. And I was always interested in enterprise. So those those things naturally led in this direction, particularly because I didn't have any creative talent myself. Had I had some creative talent, I probably would have been on the performing side, like many entertainment executives. But I found out um, reasonably early on that I didn't have any. Well, little secret, if it wasn't for my voice, I'd be an opera singer. There you go. I had read somewhere that you had set your sights on running a movie studio at a pretty young age. How how old were you when you first said, one day I'm going to run a movie studio? I was really young. It was, believe it or not, like so young that I, I, I think I read an old article where I said I was three years old. That seems, that seems unusually young, but you know, really early I decided I, I wanted to be in the movie business. And it's not like we had any family connection to the business. We did not. My father's a lawyer. And um, it's not like, you know, we lived in Los Angeles. We lived in Newton, Massachusetts at that time. So it, it, it's not clear where the ambition came from, but I was always fascinated by motion pictures, television, music, and books. So let's fast forward. You're 32 years old. 
and boom, you're running 20th Century Fox. You, you accomplish exactly what you had set your sights out. And you know, given that you went to both business and law school, that's not a lot of time between when you graduated and when you were in that seat. How did you get from point A to point B so quickly? I mean, I'd love to say that I was an incredible outlier, I suppose, but it's not really the true. In the entertainment business, young people often um, get big opportunities early on in their careers. Um, in my case, I graduated in from grad school in 1983 and went to Columbia Pictures International Television, and I was responsible for distributing, uh, overseeing the distribution of all of Columbia Pictures motion picture and television library uh, and new production in international markets. And I did well doing that. I was able to develop the first computer system that tracked uh, rights exploitation effectively. I created this, um, with the help obviously of our IT folks at the time, I created a system that would manage rights and then would automatically show our salespeople in the field what was available for sale. And previously they'd been using a manual method that was imperfect at best. So by having a, a, a computer printout, and it was a printout in those days, it wasn't online, of everything that was available, say in France on January 1st, they were able to be much more effective in selling the rights and we were able to see a very significant increase in our revenues very very quickly. And you know, my, my boss was rewarded for that and I in turn was as well. Um, and I became the youngest vice president at Columbia Pictures. And that led to my being recruited at what was then the largest independent home entertainment company, Vestron. And uh, I was brought in as senior vice president of corporate development, a job I had no particular interest in, but I had a reason I'd been led to believe by the chairman that there may be some management opportunities. And nine months after joining, when I was 30 years old, I was named president and chief operating officer of Vestron, which by then was the largest independent movie company uh, and a public company. The first picture that I greenlit became the highest grossing independent film of all time, uh, Dirty Dancing. So obviously, you know, it's better to be lucky than smart. My, my wife's favorite and movie, by the way. There, there we go. Many people's wives' favorite movie. That job where I, I made a whole lot of independent pictures put me in touch with a lot of people. I developed a number of relationships. And when Joe Roth became chairman of 20th Century Fox, he was looking for um, a president who would run the business side of the equation and the distribution side of the equation. And we'd know one another. Joe had produced a couple of movies for, for us at Vestron. And um, he hired me um, along, along with Barry Dillon, Rupert Murdoch. So that's how I, I got that job. I mean, it sounds all easy and, and, and sort of uh, planned out in hindsight, but the reality is you're a smart, driven executive, but there were a lot of smart, driven, hungry, ambitious people coming out of top schools, willing to do whatever it takes, and they don't all become president of a movie studio. Was there anything different that you think you did? Were you more driven than the typical person? Was it a little bit of being in the right place at the right time or, or maybe tethering yourself to a mentor that sort of worked his way up and brought you? There, there had to be something that allowed you to achieve that position and, and everyone else uh, just sort of you know, working through middle management. Well, a lot of, I mean, my observation is there are a whole lot of people who are a whole lot more successful than I. So I see it somewhat differently, but it, it's sort of, it's a flattering question. I think the answer is sure. I, I got lucky in, in, many, in numerous occasions where, you know, opportunities presented themselves or people took a chance on me. And I, more often than not, I think I did a pretty good job when I was put in that position. Um, I definitely was not more ambitious than many people, certainly not smarter. And you're right, a lot of Harvard Business School graduates 700 people a year, so does Harvard Law School. I, I, I think it was a combination of very much knowing what I want. Many people do not. Being willing to take risks that most people with my education don't. I turned down McKinsey and Goldman Sachs to go to Columbia Pictures in, in sales. Having this, the word sales in your title uh, coming out of the JD MBA program was really like shocking to people. And to me, I knew that if I wanted to run a movie studio, I was much more likely to get there if, by going to work at Columbia Pictures, even in sales, than I was uh, if I went to Goldman or McKinsey, even though they paid a lot more and they were much more prestigious. So I definitely made choices that were maybe non obvious. And certainly, certainly riskier uh, than my peers. There weren't a lot of people coming out of grad school in those days who were really excited about going into the entertainment business. It's a bit more typical today. 
And so I was, I was somewhat unusual in those days. There, were, there was a whole cohort of HBS guys who went into the business around that time who did well. Chase Carey, obviously done phenomenally well. Tom McGrath. Uh, and then some folks who know, who didn't stay in the business, but who were incredibly talented, like Ron Beck, who went on to to build a financial services company. But um, so I certainly wasn't the only one, and those guys did well too. So on on that note of risk, you had somewhat of what I, I might call a career pivot when you quit the studio and you go up north to join Crystal Dynamics. So you're going from this big. Uh, behemoth to a highly risky early stage video gaming startup. Strauss, you, you achieved what you wanted. You're running the studio, your lifelong dream. Here it is. And you quit cold turkey and, and go up to Crystal. What was behind that move? I'd always wanted to run a movie studio. I didn't expect it to happen as quickly as it did. And so by the time um, the opportunity to, to move to Crystal Dynamics came up, I'd been running motion picture companies for almost seven years. I'd been responsible for over 150 pictures. Been fortunate, I had a lot of hits, and our track record at Fox was great. Equally, I, w- I was mindful that the asset class, pretty tough asset class, and my view is that the career of an individual can only as- be as good as the enterprise is. In other words, your career can't be better than the quality of the business for which you work. That's not going to happen. And I, I did want to um, to build something. And I was concerned that if I stayed in the motion picture business, eventually where that would take my career was, you know, to my becoming an independent producer, which is what happens to former studio executives typically. And that isn't wasn't appealing to me at all. So I think I, I while I always knew what I wanted when when I achieved at least, you know, somewhat the goal that I'd set out to achieve, I revised that goal to say, you know what I think I'd really like to do is run a diversified media company and have equity in it. How do I do that? I think I need to start building my entrepreneurial experience and I need to expose myself to other asset classes with the media and communications and entertainment. And video games were nascent um, at the time. And I convinced myself that the quality of the business model for video games was going to be like that in the motion picture business in its early days, which was a much better business model. And I wasn't entirely wrong about that. It was was about right. Um, In fact, it did turn out to be a huge growth business. Uh, Crystal Dynamics was successful, not the most successful video video game business. I left after just a couple of years um, and ultimately was sold to Eidos successfully. That was my first exposure both to entrepreneurship and to the video game business. And while it seemed not obvious and certainly was very risky, I took a you know 95% pay cut to do it. It was exciting and it was my first taste of being my own boss. And from there to, to BMG, so from, from big to small and, and back to big again. So the couple of years you spent there was enough. You didn't want to stay in that world of early stage venture companies. You wanted to go back and, and run something uh, substantial. It was exciting to have an opportunity to, to address another asset class. Um, BMG gave me the opportunity to build a video game company, which we did, BMG Interactive, successfully. That company is ultimately sold to Take-Two Interactive including titles that were were initially developed at BMG, which are now part of Take-Two's um, intellectual property. So I, I had an, a great opportunity to do a turnaround, which I like doing, to learn a new business from the vantage point of a CEO to be a CEO. Um, there's not an economic opportunity because Bertelsmann treated their CEOs like entrepreneurs. And I felt like I'd done the job at Crystal in that we'd already meaningfully developed the business. We generated a lot of revenue. We had developed successful titles. And it was well on its way. I, I definitely had not gotten it to the finish line. And, you know, I didn't turn it into a massive enterprise. Um, so in a way, I turned left at that point. I also, I didn't love being in Silicon Valley. Um, Silicon Valley at that time was a great, maybe still today, it's a great place to be if you were a technology executive. Not a great place to be if you were an entertainment executive. And that's really how I saw myself. It just wasn't the 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 DNA of the, of the, of the area. So I, I liked it. I made some great friends there and great connections and it did, the deal worked out fine, but I was happy to have an opportunity to, to run a huge enterprise again. So let's talk about take two. You bought this company in a very distressed time. It's 2007, I believe. Company just lost, I, I think close to $200 million the year prior. Former CEO was fired for fraud. You come in, very, very tumultuous time. And here we are a decade later, you've completely turned the company around. 
you've created billions of dollars of shareholder value in the process. It's an incredible turnaround. So walk us through that. Give us the highlight reel. What were one or two of the big problems that you saw and how did you go about correcting them? Well, the company had some great assets. There were a lot of great creative people here. Uh, there were there was great intellectual property, most notably Grand Theft Auto, and the NBA franchise was already here, and they had a worldwide distribution structure. So they were already in in business. They had 700 million in net revenue. So they were they were on their way, and it's a lot easier to turn around and build up a company in a strong sector than it is to start one from scratch. That's been my experience. So we certainly were benefited by what we found here. There were challenges, too. The company was under investigation by the New York DA's office, the SEC, and the IRS. The chairman, as you, as you mentioned, had been indicted and fired. The CFO was under investigation. And the company had a huge stack of pending litigation and was losing money and had just come into compliance with uh, filing requirements and had just had a shareholder meeting, the meeting at which we took over the company. We set out to turn the company uh, around and build it up. The first thing we did was um, meaningfully cut the operating costs uh, by, I think, as much as $40 million a year, um, which certainly helped the bottom line. And then we turned our attention to building a culture that was kind, civil, rational, and also highly ambitious with a focus on creativity, efficiency, and innovation. The three words I use in every basically every announcement, every quarterly meeting, and every meeting with, with my colleagues here. And uh, we set out to diversify the product line and were able to do so successfully. So all of those things worked and we had the benefit of being in a growth business. You know, I said at the time and it continues to be true, interactive entertainment is the, is the most rapidly growing part of the entertainment business. It probably will be for the next 20 years. So the win was at our back and we were well positioned with the Grand Theft Auto franchise and others, and immensely creative people who, who really wanted to succeed, who, um, who'd been burdened by the way the corporation had been managed. And minimally, we tried to get out of their way. I mean, we may not have done anything else well, but we did get out of the way of the creative people and let them pursue and encourage them to pursue their passions. So what happened, we launched one new successful intellectual property a year, almost every year since we've taken over. Um, we've built up all of the intellectual properties that we had. We improved the quality of the marketing teams worldwide, improved the quality of the distribution teams worldwide, improved the quality of the corporate teams, opened an Asia headquarters in Singapore, began to build an Asia business, diversified into free to play with the launch of NBA 2K online in China, and um, further diversified into what we now call recurrent consumer spending, which is consumer engagement outside of full game downloads digitally. So that would be downloadable add-on content, uh, in-game payments, virtual currency, and the like. So that's really been the story. It's a, it's it's phenomenal. Today we have, as you said, a market uh, value meaningfully in excess of four billion dollars. Continue to to beat our guidance, and we've been profitable for at least five years in a row. We announced last quarter we had 1.4 billion dollars in cash and no debt. It's it's a great state of play, and we have. Nearly 3,000 employees all around the world engaged in, in making the very best interactive entertainment that can possibly be made. It's a great story. I, I want to go back to a point you just made about staying out of the way in regards to the, the creative teams, the creative process in the company. I've been in entertainment myself, and as you know, the entertainment industry has plenty of pretty big egos. And those egos compel CEOs in many of these companies to do the opposite, to get very involved in the creative process, to greenlight projects, to uh, have their say in how these things evolve. And it feels like it takes a certain amount of, of introspection, of knowing what you're really good at and where to let others take over the reins. But it's easier said than done. Have you always been that way or is that something that you've developed over time? Look, I've... Been a long, long list of flaws, but I have a couple good points too. And one of them is I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I'm not, my ego doesn't drive me to pretend that I know things I don't. Um, I think I've always felt that the best executives were those who sought out people who are more capable than they and encouraged them to do their jobs with information. I don't believe in raw delegation. I don't believe in using the words, just do it. And if you say, just do it, you run the risk that it'll get done, but not in the way you want or not in an ethical way, for example. However, I do believe in delegation with information. 
and empowering people to pursue their skills and encouraging people to pursue their passions, whether they're in a creative role or a business role. I remember um, early on in my career, uh, because it was, it did move pretty quickly. Uh, someone who worked for me said, I can't believe you hired that person because he slash she, I'm not sure who it was, is so incredibly competent. Aren't you worried they're going to want your job? I said, well, I hope they're going to want my job. I, I hire ambitious people. And this person said, well, what happens if, the, you know, he slash she gets your job? And I said, well, I guess they'd get my job if they were better at it than I. And if that's the case, that's probably good for the company. And that's what I'm actually paid to do. And I never, ever found that my career got hurt by doing the right thing for the company ever. It's not because I was being falsely modest and there's no one better than I. It's not the case. It's that when you're employed to build a business and run a business well, that's the job for which you're getting paid. You're there to be of service. And if there comes a point where you're no longer the right manager, that should be okay. That should be okay with you. And if you're capable, then you'll go on to the next thing. And if maybe you aren't so capable in certain areas, you'll learn from that, either develop that capability or turn your attention to something that you are better at. So, for example, when I left Fox to go to Crystal, Peter Chernin, who was then my boss, and Rupert Murdoch said, look, we'll let you out of your contract, but we're not letting you out of your contract till you recruit your replacement, which is unusual, an unusual structure, but it was fair. And I knew there was only one person in Hollywood who I felt could do the job as well or better than I did, who was Bill Mechanic who was happily employed at Disney. And I spent a couple months because I was really anxious to go do this thing at Crystal, recruiting Bill, who had no interest in leaving initially. And eventually I recruited Bill to become president of Fox, um, which he was successfully and ultimately became chairman of the studio. And when I left Fox and we, you know, in a way, 20th Century Fox was a turnaround. We took it over. It was in last place at the box office, putting out four or five pictures a year. When, we, when I left, it was in first place at the box office and had been for three years. Um, so, you know, I, I was proud of what we had done there on both the production and the distribution side. Bill and Peter, after I left, took a lot of steps to build up the business. They made a bunch of changes. They opened an animation studio. Uh, they added Fox Searchlight and other labels. So they made a long list of changes, almost all of which were positive and sensible and built the company up and moved it forward. And I didn't look at it saying, uh, oh, those guys, you know, they didn't listen to me and, you know, look what they screwed up. To the contrary, I was proud of the fact that I'd done the best I could and then left the place in the hands of people who could do even better. Uh, it seems to me that's what I'm paid to do. I thought that was a great result, not a bad result. The way you set these uh, forward-looking, ambitious goals when you were young, and then you achieve them, and then you move on to the next mountain and the next one, do you still do that to this day? I guess the question is, what keeps you motivated? You've had all the success in the world, but what keeps you going day in, day out? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I don't feel like I've had all the success in the world at all. I feel like, you know, as I said, a long list of things I've screwed up um, and wish I'd done better and many things, many, many things uh, yet left undone. I describe my career right now as, you know, that line, what do you call 100 lawyers in a fiery pit? A good start. I think my career right now is it's been a good start. I think we have a great opportunity at ZMC and at Take Two. ZMC is incredibly well positioned in the media and communication space. They're wonderful investment opportunities. We have plenty of capital under management to pursue those opportunities and great investors who want us to do so. And Take Two continues to operate in this incredibly exciting space, interactive entertainment, and is now the number three company in the space, um, which means we're not number one or two. It strikes me as an interesting opportunity. I don't, I don't have an unlimited personal desire for wealth. That doesn't really motivate me. Incremental dough doesn't make you incrementally happy once you have a roof over your head and you can clothe and feed and educate your family. So it's not that. And it isn't really ego gratification because I, I try to keep a relatively low profile. And it's certainly someone, you know, the motivation is certainly not power. Someone said to me, what's it like to have all that power? I was like, are you kidding? You know, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Just a guy who works, goes to work in the mornings. What, what, what possible power could you be referring to? And then, you know, people scratch their heads and think about it. And they're like, well, you know, technically you could do fire someone or spend some money. And, and yes, the answer is as soon as you do something egotistical, crazy, irrational, or senseless to exercise your fragile ego in the form of power, you know, that's the moment coincident with your career going south. 
For me, what's exciting is achievement, you know, looking at something that's challenging and assembling a great team and then together partially or maybe even entirely achieving a, an ambitious goal and then doing it again. That's really exciting. And I like being in business and I like the financial consequences because they're fun. And I love working within digital media because it's constantly changing. My own view is that the next 40 years will be much more exciting than the last 40 years. And the good news is while, you know, I, I'm hardly a child, I feel like I'm 25 years old. I feel like I'm at the beginning of my career. And um, so what a, what a luxurious place to be. Um, if it turns out that I'm not at the beginning of my career, I will not be the one to worry about that because I will be by definition gone. <laughs> so I think it's sensible to look at the world that way. My father-in-law is 89 years old and he's still an entrepreneur investing in companies, buying companies, selling companies, raising funds, taking companies public. He's having a blast. He creates a lot of value, keeps them young. And I, I'm pretty sure he feels, you know, the same age I feel, which is 25. You say you've had plenty of screw ups along the way. Is there any particular failure that comes to mind that you could talk to us about? Well, let's distinguish between a mistake and a failure. I make mistakes all the time. We all do. But if you make a mistake and you take responsibility and do your best to correct it, it really typically doesn't matter. And so I can't enumerate mistakes because I make them daily, uh, as, as any human does. But I'm reasonably good about identifying them. And I'm, I'm very, very good at, at stepping up and taking personal responsibility and trying to make it right. I guess I've managed, with the help of my wife, I've managed my ego to a place where I really don't expect perfection out of myself. I'd like it. I aim for it. But I really don't expect it. So it'll frustrate me when I make a stupid mistake. But if I if I make steps to to fix it, then I, I tend to give myself a break. My view is that a failure is actually typically an accumulation of many, many little or not so little mistakes that you didn't fix along the way. So as a result, I haven't had so many failures. Um, I had one significant situation where I lost rights to an act at BMG uh, that I shouldn't have lost the rights to. And it was to another party that I had a very close relationship with. And the mistake was really because I had I projected onto another person my my own values and my own ethical approach. And that was a huge mistake. You know, I was looking in the mirror instead of looking across the room. And I learned a great lesson, which is see people as they are, not as you wish they would be. And um, most people are I found in business, including this business, highly ethical, decent people who can be trusted. But now and then people can't be. And that was one of those situations. And it, and it hurt the company badly. The second big mistake, probably more painful one, which, which is, you know, we're we at ZMC are, see ourselves as a highly ethical enterprise. Um, but many years ago, early on, we made a choice um, that ultimately violated the trust of one of our partners. It was it wasn't the way we saw it. It wasn't what we thought we were doing. But ultimately, that's what it was. And under the bright light of day and sent and sort of uh, sensitive examination, it's clear that we cut ethical corners that we shouldn't have cut. And that was very painful because I had to acknowledge that. I had to acknowledge in the culture that we'd established, which is one of highly ethical behavior. I had to take responsibility and I had to uh, try to make it right. I did all of that, but it was still a very painful, very painful experience. But one I learned from, one I learned from because the truth is we had that experience early on when, you know, there were single digit millions of dollars at stake. Uh, and by the way, the, the, the lapse cost us a couple million dollars to solve uh, at a time when we didn't really have that. But today our business is big enough that if we had that kind of a lapse now, it could cost us billions of dollars and, and hurt many employees and investors. We, we learned a, a really, really good lesson. And what we say now is, you know, never mind crossing the line. If we can see the line, we're too close to it. Makes sense. I want to switch gears for a minute. You've been out somewhat promoting this active lifestyle working out and, and nutrition. And I, I've seen this, some video clips from this daily fitness, I guess, meetup group you have. It looks pretty intense. I and mean, you're working out with people half your age, you're doing pretty uh, intense, uh, high interval training exercises. Has this sort of fitness and, and health regimen always been a part of your life or has it accelerated recently? It's o both. It's always been a part of my life. And as I've aged, it's accelerated. And the last 10 years, it's really accelerated uh, with the creation of what this this morning fitness group, which is called the program that you alluded to. 
And, uh, you know, I, it's my hobby. Fitness is my hobby. I, I, I love it. So, um, it's challenging, which is great. It definitely keeps you healthy. I almost never get sick. It makes you feel good. It all helps you look as good as you can look, which is, which is a, a benefit in life and in business and keeps my, my spirits positive. So I'm a big believer in it. It's not for everyone. Um, but, but it seems to work for me and for my friends. So you feel there's, there's positive spillover effects into your business life and into your personal life? Unquestionably. I mean, you know, take a look at ZMC, you know, culture is set at the top for better, for worse. It's an incredibly active firm. The professionals at the firm are never, ever sick. So while I don't do it to increase productivity, it has the effect of increasing productivity. But when people, you know, take good care of themselves, they feel good about themselves. When they feel good about themselves, they do a better job at work. They present a, a, you know, a great outlook to the outside world. And it's an attractive outlook. We're bright and shiny and freshly showered and smiling when we show up at meetings. I think it's encouraging to other people. I think, you know, it's part of leadership to convey energy and excitement and that anything is possible. And I do have the view that anything is possible. And I demand that of myself and I fall short regularly um, in my morning workouts because I train with virtually everyone I train with is a former varsity athlete who's less than half of my age and some professional athletes, current professional athletes. So you can imagine that it is an interesting challenge for me to measure up. And, um, you know, I, I hold my own. I'm somewhere somewhere in the 50th percent, the 50th to 70th percentile in terms of capability, which is not so terrible. I'm it, proud of that. It, it looked very impressive. So beyond, beyond fitness, any other daily habits you do to stay sharp, focus, you know, control stress, do you meditate, do you do yoga, do you walk, or is it is really fitness and work, everything? Fitness is a big part of it. I also have a, a, a spiritual practice that really matters to me. Um, and uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not really focused on organized religion, but I do have a, a deep spiritual life. I think some form of spirituality or meditation is really important. I do do yoga. Um, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, I'm not opposed to it for others, but I, I don't do it. So, you know, I try to get to bed early. I'm happily married. I have a lot of really nice friends. I'd say the other practice I have that I made a decision about a long time ago, I was still at BMG, was no more toxic people in my life. And if you need a definition of what a toxic person is, Toxic person is that friend who you have lunch with now and then. And when you leave lunch, you feel just slightly worse about yourself than before lunch. And I realized um, I'm not I'm just not going to have people like that in my life. Not in a nasty way, not in a pleasant way. It just wasn't just wasn't positive. One of the great benefits of of having your own company is I can choose how I devote my time and I really do move our company and our people away from toxicity. That's an enormous part of my approach to life and how I can operate what people perceive to be, a, you know, a competitive field. My experience of what we do is that it's, it's gentle and sweet most of the time. We deal with really nice people trying to do really good work. And sure, we have unpleasant discussions now and then in some conflict. I mean, we, if you're going to avoid conflict, then you're going to make some terrible decisions in business. But we, but the, the pitch and the tone is a, is a kind and gentle pitch and tone that makes life enjoyable for me. And that's a choice, you know, dealing with toxic people or engaging in toxic behavior. It's a choice. Just go to Starbucks, stand in line, look around, see how people are behaving. You know, some people have a smile on their face and they interact a little bit with the people behind the counter and treat them, you know, as though they are also uh, humans on the face of the earth who deserve respect. And then other people don't look up from their phones and say, I'll have, I'll have X. I'm always astonished when people are in a service environment and say, I'll have whoever taught you to say that. How about, how are you? You know, may I please have, thank you very much. And so you'll, you can witness in life and we do, and, and, and we do in public life as well. We, we see numerous beautiful examples of lovely, gentle, kind behavior. And then sadly, we see examples of exceedingly unpleasant behavior. And I found is, you know, I have the luxury of choice. Not everyone does. If I had to earn a living working at a toxic enterprise, I didn't seem to have any other choices. Hey, you know what? You got to feed your family. You know, we all have to work. Sometimes you have to make hard choices. I, I'm aware that I have the luxury of choice. 
But what I observe is lots of people have that same luxury of choice and they don't choose this path. And those are the people who say to me, I don't know how you live in New York City. It's, it seems so stressful. It's like stressful. You know, there's a snowstorm today. It's pretty hard to get around in any way except the subway. So I've been running around in the subway today. I'm not remotely stressed. You know, it seems like a bunch of nice people just trying to go about their business. We're fortunate that we have an incredible subway system. Knowing everything you know today, successes, failures, business life, personal life, if you could jump in a time machine, go back 30 years and give the 20-something Strauss Zelnick some advice, what do you think you'd say? Well, I think it wouldn't be any different than the advice I give you know, young people today. I do, I do a lot of coaching and mentoring, and I have a lot of young friends. You know, I wouldn't have needed the advice about try really hard to pursue something that you love because I did. And I wouldn't have needed the advice of, you know, if you can figure out what you want life to look like in 20, 30 or 40 years, you know, you enhance the odds of getting it because I did those two things. You know, I, I and in fact, that latter advice is crucial advice for a lot of people. You know, if you don't know what you want, you don't know where you're going, um, how do you get there? And especially if you're educated and talented, you're going to have loads of opportunities and choices. If you don't know where, what the goal is, you're going to take the next shiny object. Uh, you know, that's what you're going to pick up. I knew that I wanted to be in the media and entertainment business, and I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur ultimately. And that's what I do today. I'm an entrepreneur in the media and communications and entertainment business. You know, I knew I wanted to have a happy marriage and a family. And so I guess I made a choice, fortunately, to marry marry the right person. And I've been married 27 years and I have, you know, wonderful kids and I'm not perfect. My wife's not per perfect. My kids aren't perfect. So let's just dispense of the fantasy. But, you know, we've really happy, harmonious, lovely household, you know, with all of our foibles and all of our ups and downs. So what would I have told myself? I probably would have said, if you would just pull back and relax a little bit, you'd probably be more effective, not less effective because I was super intense. I would have said, read How to Win Friends and Influence People because I didn't read it till I was about 31 and I wish I'd read it earlier. It's a phenomenal book. I needed it because it's a book that teaches you, despite its goofy title, to focus on the other person and be of, surface, be of service to another person. That's a great way to live. That's really what that book teaches and I really needed to learn that. And I think ultimately I would have told myself, take the risk to present yourself all the time as you truly are as opposed to presenting yourself as you wish to be seen. Because the more comfortable I got with myself, the more I was willing to let go of fears and insecurities, uh, the more willing I was to, um, to be goofy at times or to fail or to admit errors, the more compelling I was as a friend, as a father, as a husband, uh, as, as a colleague, as an employee, and ultimately as a leader. It can sound a little... I don't know, sound a little oxymoronic, but being being your authentic self is the right way to lead. Um, you know, being willing to admit your limitations is the right way to lead. And uh, and it took me a while. It took me a while. I think I came across as super tough and unapproachable and cold. Um, and I was confident. I was highly confident. So I was seen as not approachable. And that stood very much in the way of my expressing leadership skills, which is probably the thing I'm most proud of today and not leadership skills in the way I think people fantasize about them. Leadership is not about showing up, pushing people over and taking names. Leadership is about being of service to a team and bringing out the best in your colleagues in the pursuit of a common goal. That's leadership. And the best leaders are people who see themselves as part of the team, often as the least important member of the team, because the truth is it's CEOs. I'm a CEO. CEOs don't do any real work. The work is done elsewhere. Right? You, if we maybe set strategy, that's probably real work. But apart from that, we really are tasked with making sure the enterprise moves in the direction of a common goal and that the people who do the work achieve those goals, you know, create that progress. And so I think, you know, it's a long answer to a short question. But in my case, I think it's good that you know what you want. It's good that you're following your passion. Um, be willing sooner rather than later to be true to yourself and to expose that truth to other people. That will make you a more effective human being and, and a better leader. That's a great answer.
Strauss, you are truly an inspiration and I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your incredibly hectic schedule and spending time with me. Well, thanks. They're wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for reaching out. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.